This week on BuzzFeed Unsolved, we investigate the Roswell incident, either the biggest UFO cover-up of all time, or just the biggest misunderstanding of all time. Either way, 70 years later, we're still debating about it. This is the holy grail of alien stories, in my opinion. Yeah, it's a buzzword. You hear it all the time. Yeah. Uh, I don't know all the gritty details. Desert, government, aliens, etc. All right, let's get into it's it. Spin a yarn, Tommy Bahama. The year is 1947, a year that saw an unusually large wave of reported UFO sightings. In the last six months of 1947 alone, there were over 300 claims of UFO sightings. Among these is the infamous Roswell incident. Skeptics and believers alike can agree on one thing. Something crashed in the fields of Foster Ranch, located just northwest of Roswell, New Mexico. Whether that something is something extraordinary or mundane remains highly debated. You're, you're clearly on, on, the, on the skeptic side here already going in, right? That's a dumbass question. Of course you are. You're fucking Shane. All right. Don't try to paint me as a... I'll paint you however I want. Don't you... What? I'll paint the hell out of you however I want. You paint me in your free time? Yeah. <laughs> They're good. Oh, you, Jesus. You want to see them? No, yeah, never. Let's go through the official timeline as played out in the media and through official reports from the U.S. Air Force. Sometime before June 14th, a crash occurred on Foster Ranch. On July 4th, a local rancher named Mac Brazel visits the crash site to pick up some of the debris. On July 7th, Mac Brazel decides to take some of the debris to local sheriff George Wilcox. Wilcox then contacts Colonel Butch Blanchard at the nearby military base, the Roswell Army Airfield. This Roswell base was home to the elite 509th Bombardment Group, which deployed atomic bombs at the end of World War II. Colonel Blanchard alerts his superior, General Roger W. Ramey, and orders Major Jesse Marcel, the 509th's intelligence officer, to assess the crash site and recover the materials. So much bureaucracy here. I mean, it's the military. You gotta call one guy, he calls a different guy, who calls this guy, orders this guy to call that guy, and then that guy's, this is why information gets muddled in cases like these, because yeah, you got this big shitty chain of command. It's like game of telephone, essentially, but yeah. it's a, the military, it's a ladder structure. It's of course it's gonna be that way. Game of phones. Oh my God. Good, huh? No, that was, that was terrible. That was good. I'm actually upset right now. Good. Colonel Blanchard is briefed by intelligence officer Marcel on his crash site visit, and on the morning of July 8th, consequently orders Public Information Officer Lieutenant Walter Hott to issue a press release stating that they believe they have a, quote, flying saucer, end quote, in their possession. Soon after, the Roswell Daily Record's front page ran the headline, quote, Roswell Army Airfield captures flying saucer on ranch in Roswell region, end quote, where they reveal no details of, quote, the flying disc. End quote. That same day, the Air Force strangely changes their story. General Ramey orders the crash remains to be taken to him in Fort Worth, Texas for his own personal inspection. He and his staff, including a base weather officer, identify them as pieces of a weather balloon and issue a subsequent press release with the correction. A photo is taken in Ramey's office of intelligence officer Marcel with the crash materials he misidentified. If you're a higher up and you see this press release and you're like, what the fucker? What is going on? <laughs> I gotta go clean this up now? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I knew that we were, you know, pushing our big weather balloons through that area. Oh, and you're, oh, I see what you're saying. And I'm like, well, they're not gonna believe me unless I bring in Carl or whatever the guy's name. And you make know. him sit next to his mistake. Bring in the weatherman, bring in the, the idiot rancher and kind of rub his nose in it like a, I think it's hilarious that the officer they sent to go assess the crash, they made him sit and pose with all the materials in the office in the picture. You sit here for this photograph. You know that's a weather balloon, you idiot. <laughs> the next day, on July 9th, the Roswell Daily Record runs another article with the headline, quote, harassed rancher who located saucer, sorry he told about it, end quote, in which Brazel reveals that the supposed alien wreckage was merely, quote, rubber strips, tinfoil, a rather tough paper, and sticks, end quote. And with Ramey's weather balloon explanation being corroborated by the case's key witness, the world promptly forgets about the Roswell incident. 
for a while. Enter Stanton Friedman in 1978. Friedman was a nuclear physicist and leading UFO researcher. In 1978, Friedman interviewed Jesse Marcel, the then retired intelligence officer from the 509th, who was ordered to go assess the wreckage of the Roswell incident. Marcel would fully reignite the Roswell controversy when he revealed that he still believed the wreckage was definitively not a weather balloon. Here's a quote from Major Marcel in a different interview regarding the metal at the crash site. Quote, it felt like you had nothing in your hands. It wasn't any thicker than the foil out of a pack of cigarettes. But the thing about it that got me is that you couldn't even bend it. You couldn't dent it. Even a sledgehammer would bounce off of it. I knew that I had never seen anything like that before, end quote. He goes on to say, quote, it was not anything from this earth. That I'm quite sure of. Being an intelligence officer, I was familiar with just about all materials used in aircraft and or air travel. This was nothing like that. It could not have been, end quote. That is some funky, funky metal. I mean, they took a sledgehammer to it. I like, I like the sound of this metal. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like I want to get some ha my hands on this metal. I like that he's giving some tactile descriptions here. It's not just something, something wasn't right. It was glowing shiny. Yeah, he's talking about, he's talking about the weight of it, the feel of it. I like this. After this admission, Friedman interviewed more witnesses, both civilian and military and in the end concluded that there had been a massive cover-up of the Roswell incident in 1947, a quote, cosmic Watergate, end quote. A cover-up that allegedly includes details of the crash site, the materials, the possible spacecraft, and even alien bodies found at the scene. And with that, let's get into the two main theories. The first theory is that the events at Roswell transpired as reported, and the alien wreck was merely a weather balloon, as stated by the Air Force. When you look at the physical evidence available, this appears to be what happened. Though, in 1994, the US Air Force released a report admitting that there was, in fact, a cover-up. However, it wasn't a cover-up of extraterrestrials, but instead a cover-up of a top-secret military operation. The report states that the remains found on Foster Ranch in 1947 were indeed the remains of a weather balloon, but not any regular weather balloon. This balloon was part of a then top secret program called Project Mogul. Project Mogul was conceived of by Dr. Maurice Ewing at Columbia University. He theorized that just as underwater microphones could detect sound waves produced by explosions thousands of miles away, perhaps an airborne monitoring system could do the same. Thus, as fears of nuclear war proliferated after World War II and intensified at the start of the Cold War, the top secret airborne weather balloons of Project Mogul were launched to detect any nuclear tests carried out by the Soviets. Oh boy, that's a big explanation. Yeah, here's the thing. If people are already on you for a cover-up, I don't think it's a good card to play to be like, well, there was a cover-up. Right. That's why we're acting so weird. But it was this, not that. Don't look over there. Look over here. Like, the same thing. Yeah, and they're also, it's sort of they're trying to have their cake and eat it too by saying, there was a cover-up, but it was just a real nice weather balloon. <laughs> yeah, like you've never seen, this made one. out of some real strange metal. Very shiny. Oh, it was the shiniest weather balloon you've ever seen. Project Mogul's balloons were tested out at several locations around the US and in the Pacific. And one of these locations was over New Mexico in the summer of 1947. Project Mogul balloons typically measured over 650 feet long and had a tail on which various listening and sensory equipment was attached, which the military posits could possibly be misidentified as a UFO. If it was 600 feet, it's gonna be a huge pile of debris. There's gonna be a lot of weird shit there. You're gonna be very confused. At a glance. From far away, I'd be like, holy shit, look at that field, littered no. with debris. No, no, no. And I You get would close. walk up to no. it and be like, the end is nigh. <laughs> no. You'd go running through town, oh. ringing a bell. No. The Martians are here. <laughs> no. I... Lock yourselves in your basements. <laughs> what I would do is maybe I'd do that running towards it. Then I'd get close and be like, oh, it's a fucking tongue depressors and Elmer's glue. Because that's what it was. Balsa wood sticks. You got to keep it light if you want it to float. 
that's not alien materials is what I'm getting at. I would obviously get close and be like, oh, this is just human shit. In February of 1994, the General Accounting Office of the US Congress initiated an audit at the request of New Mexico Congressman Steve Schiff, a UFO skeptic, to locate all government records relating to the Roswell incident and determine if these records were handled properly. The report was published by the US Air Force in 1995, titled, quote, The Roswell Report, Fact versus Fiction in the New Mexico Desert, end quote. The findings of the audit supported the theory that the debris found in 1947 was from a balloon used in Project Mogul and found no evidence that aliens or alien spacecraft were involved. The report concludes that Marcel and Blanchard's original flying saucer press release was in part an overreaction, and in part due to the fact that flying saucer was a new term that didn't yet have a clear meaning. Bullshit. Oh. Well, that's fair. Are you fucking kidding me? So flying saucer at that point didn't necessarily mean space alien, it was just literally like, that looks like the thing I put my tea on, but it's levitating. Right? What? You're gonna say that they didn't know what they meant when they said flying saucer? I mean, it hasn't always been in like the, the national lexicon. There weren't people in ancient Rome saying flying saucer. In 1997, the Air Force released another report titled, quote, the Roswell Report, case closed end quote, in which they offered this possible explanation for claims to alien bodies found at the crash site. In the mid-1950s, the military tested the effects of parachute jumping on humans by dropping human-like dummies over New Mexico. The dummies had latex or plastic skin and could be mistaken for alien bodies by witnesses at the Roswell crash. But, if these dummy drops were in the mid-1950s, how could this possibly explain the Roswell incident that preceded it by several years? The military has an answer for that too. Air Force Colonel John Haynes explains that during the recounting of events decades later, details, quote, tend to become compressed, end quote, suggesting both he and the Air Force actually believe that witnesses are mixing up events from the mid-1950s with what were perhaps the most horrifying memories of their lives years earlier. Yeah, we've all done it. No. Right? No, I mean, if, sure, if I'm trying to remember what I had for breakfast a year ago, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna be a little foggy on that. But if I'm remembering that time I saw alien bodies uh, shrown from a wreckage, I think I'm gonna remember that quite clear and when it happened. Another discrepancy is the fact that the bodies are repeatedly described as, quote, little, end quote, often four feet or less, yet the dummies used in these drops were six feet tall. It's unclear how this contradiction is also an effect of time compression. That being said, one interesting tidbit from the report is the fact that upon requesting files from the Roswell Air Force Base from the year of the Roswell incident in 1947, it was found that all records from that time, from January through October 1947, had been destroyed. And even more suspicious, the person or organization that had destroyed these files and the authority under which they had done so were not indicated. No. This is a reach. That's a bit of a reach. There, that's all I wanted to hear. No, it's a bit of a reach. <laughs> you know, and some of this is gonna be baloney, others, other, uh, other gonna, bits I might not be so sure. This one is certified fresh? Yeah. That's I'll, a fresh I'll, cut. I'll take a bite of that. <laughs> that's a fresh cut. And with that, let's get into the second theory, that the government engaged in a cover-up to hide knowledge of alien life. Well, actually, before I get into it, I do have one more thing. What's, no, no, no. This is not usually part of the sh thing. What are you doing? Are you putting on a tinfoil hat? <laughs> Before I get into this, I would like to preface this theory with the fact that most of this is based off interviews with those who claimed to have eyewitness testimony. The amount of witnesses is said to be more than 600 people, ranging from civilian to high level military. Some details of these stories vary between sources, 
so we've chosen to mainly focus on interviews conducted by two respected researchers named Thomas J. Carey and Donald R. Schmidt for their book, quote, Witness to Roswell, Unmasking the 60-Year Cover-Up, end quote. And while most skeptics will scoff at that notion, consider this. If there were hundreds of witnesses to a murder, all recounting similar details of the crime, would you doubt they were telling the truth? I don't know, I guess it depends on the circumstances. No, if there's hundreds of people- I just don't want you to have any satisfaction. You know I'm making a good point there. If there's hundreds of I'm people- I'm not gonna give it to you. No, you're gonna get, you already, uh, by you saying I'm not giving the satisfaction means you internally want to agree with that. If there's, if there's only eyewitness proof and no, no actual proof sure, of the murder? Sure, if there's five people, but if there's 600 that have high level military fucking people within that group- No blood though? No blood, no evidence, no nothing. There's 600 people, Just, why would they all lie? The more riled up you get right now, the worse you come off because of this accessory. Yeah, I realize- It's really, it's I really real, not helping I realize you. now that this was a very bad call. I thought it'd be really funny, but now I realize I look like a fucking fool. Let's begin by going over suspicious details around the time of the crash, particularly the contradiction between the official record and eyewitness testimony. When Mac Brazel took some of the crash debris to the sheriff, debris that crash site witnesses described as otherworldly, Brazel also reportedly admitted something significant. According to a local radio personality, Frank Joyce of the KGFL radio station, Brazel admitted that the crash site was likely a UFO, and more importantly, that there were alien bodies on the scene. According to Judd Roberts, a minority owner of KGFL radio station, this admission would be recorded later, but KGFL did not air the interview due to phone calls from the FCC and US Senator Dennis Chavez urging them not to. If you've got a crazy guy still spouting lies, yeah, I'll, I'll put a stop to him. Or you got a very sane guy spouting truth. Yeah, or that. <laughs> As detailed before, the military would issue an incendiary press release saying they have a flying saucer only to correct themselves a day later. Like the military, Brazel would also recant any statements made about UFOs at this time. According to researchers Carrie and Schmidt, shortly after Brazel's new statements, neighbors said Brazel purchased a brand new pickup truck and left his job as a rancher to start a business in Alamogordo, New Mexico. Also suspicious in Carrie and Schmidt's findings were testimonies from locals and Brazel's family that revealed Brazel was detained by the military around this time, further suggesting that he could have been forced to recant his statements about UFOs. The military also reportedly threatened locals to keep quiet as well as ransack their homes for remaining crash site materials. This is corroborated by the testimony of the foster daughter of Colonel Hunter G. Penn, an Army Air Force officer who supposedly admitted to his foster daughter that he was tasked with enforcing a quote, information blackout, end quote, with a focus on the little bodies. He was authorized to use physical force and weaponry if necessary to get this accomplished. Another interesting contradiction was that Colonel Blanchard, the superior to Major Marcel, who approved the initial flying saucer press release, strangely went on leave after he issued the controversial release. However, according to Lieutenant Colonel Joe Briley, who was a staff member of Colonel Blanchard's, the reported leave was actually a cover-up to allow Blanchard to coordinate a cleanup operation of the crash site. I mean, if he fucked up and was like, yeah, it's UFOs. And they were like, no, it's not UFOs, you stupid piece of shit. <laughs> we'll, we'll fix your mess. Why don't leave. you take a little time off? Why don't you leave? Get your shit together, get your life together. Yeah, why don't you leave so people could look at that later and be like, why did he leave after he makes this weird announcement? I don't think they care, again. I don't well, think they I care. I mean, they should care if they're people who concentrate on details. That's what I'm saying. Perhaps the key contradiction is the photo taken in General Ramey's office of the supposed crash site materials. A sealed statement, apparently written by Roswell Army Airfield's public information officer, Lieutenant Walter G. Hott, which was only to be opened after his death, claimed the photo taken in Ramey's office was a hoax. Hott wrote that the actual crash materials were substituted with weather balloon materials and then photographed with Marcel, a fact that upset Marcel. 
Just to hammer home the possibility of a cover-up, a man named Ben Games was a personal pilot to then Major General Lawrence C. Craigie, the chief of the engineering division at Wright Field, the Air Force Base commonly thought to be where the UFO and aliens were transported and housed. According to Games' testimony, he flew Major General Craigie to Roswell to examine the crash wreckage, and after a few hours, flew General Craigie directly to DC to meet with President Truman. A few months later, Craigie assumed the position of Air Force Chief Director of R&D, and perhaps, influenced by what he saw at Roswell, founded Project Sign, the first official investigation of UFOs by the US Air Force. You know, maybe he got there and said, this is obviously a weather balloon. A UFO wouldn't do this. It's not what UFOs are like. And they were like, oh, this guy knows a lot about what UFOs aren't. No. Yeah. <laughs> no. You don't. <laughs> this guy's got a good eye for what isn't a UFO. So you're saying they send someone out in the ocean and be like, oh, man, I didn't find Godzilla out here. We just start a program about finding out about Godzilla. I mean, clearly he's got a good eye for detecting what's not bullshit. Now that we've established the cover up in timeline, let's quickly go over some of the controversial and fascinating details of this theory, starting with the reported alien bodies at the scene. These supposed witnesses are consistent in their descriptions of the bodies as short in stature, maybe three and a half to four feet, with large heads, large eyes, only holes for a nose, and a small slit for the mouth. Numerous military officials have claimed to hear secondhand information of the bodies or even see the aliens for themselves. To name a few, there's First Lieutenant and Public Information Officer at the Roswell base, Walter G. Hott, retired Brigadier General Arthur E. Exxon, and Tech Sergeant Herschel Grice. Moving on to the spacecraft, according to Sergeant William C. Ennis, he was at the time a flight engineer of the 393rd Bomb Squadron stationed in one of the primary receiving hangars for the debris, called Hangar P-3. For years, Sergeant Ennis denied the crash, writing it off as a weather balloon like the rest of the military. However, in 2008, Sergeant Ennis changed his tune, admitting, quote, it was a spaceship. After all these years, I still don't know how that ship flew. There was no engine. Before I go, I'd like to know, end quote. Before I go, I gotta know how that ship flew. Was he on his deathbed <laughs> no, when no, he said but oh. I'd like to imagine him like talking to his grandson. Yeah. The ship had no wings, Jimmy. I don't know how it flew. Jimmy, I think that ship was bedeviled. <laughs> the craft was also confirmed in numerous other testimonies, notably by Lieutenant Walter Hott, who described in his affidavit a ship Colonel Blanchard had shown to him that was roughly 12 to 15 feet long and windowless. To close this out, let's move on to the scattered debris from the crash site, which many claimed included a mysterious material that was described as, quote, memory metal. Summed up from more than two dozen witness testimonies ranging from military to civilian, the metal was said to be weightless, smooth, thin, and could not be cut, scratched, or burned, though the metal was able to be temporarily manipulated. Here's a quote from Roswell Army Airfield Sergeant Earl Fulford, quote, I picked it up, but once in the palm of your hand, you could wad it up into a small ball. Then, when you let it go, it would immediately assume its original shape in a second or two, just like that, end quote. This free-flowing quality of the metal was echoed amongst many testimonies, Retired Brigadier General Arthur E. Exxon said, quote, some could be easily ripped or changed. There were other parts of it that were very thin, but awfully strong and couldn't be dented with heavy hammers, end quote. Exxon also explained that these observations were from his time as a Lieutenant Colonel when he was also an administration student in technology at Wright Field's Foreign Technology Division, a division whose purpose was to reverse engineer foreign tech. Additionally, a memo surfaced in the early 1980s detailing a September 15, 1950 conversation between physicist Robert I. Sarbacher, a consultant with the U.S. Department of Defense Research and Development Board, and other government scientists. In the memo, Sarbacher is said to have worked on a failed reverse engineering project, 
allegedly stating, quote, all we know is we didn't make them, and it's pretty certain they didn't originate on the earth, end quote. That's good. I love it. I'm just, I think right now I'm just, just punching the skeptics in the face over and over again. I'm slowly hammering away. One last point in favor of a cover-up. Let's assume that the military is telling the truth and that the crash was indeed a fancy Project Mogul weather balloon. That still does not change the fact that the remains found at the crash site were apparently, quote, rubber strips, tinfoil, a rather tough paper, and sticks, end quote, as stated by Brazel in the days after the story broke. The military has never said Brazel's description was inaccurate, and you can even see these common items in the photo in Raimi's office. So let's assume these were in fact the items found at the crash site, and forget about the allure of the seemingly high-tech Project Mogul balloon. With that in mind, let's return to Major Jesse Marcel, the intelligence officer tasked with evaluating the crash site. Marcel pointed out he was well-versed in, quote, all materials used in aircraft and or air travel, end quote, and was also a graduate from the Army's Air Force Training Command in radar technology. How could this man mistake rubber strips and tinfoil for parts of an alien spaceship? Perhaps the answer lies in a quote from Marcel himself. Quote, all I could do is keep my mouth shut and General Raimi was the one who told the newsman what it was and to forget about it. It was nothing more than a weather observation balloon. Of course, we both knew differently." End quote. First off, I'd like to toot my own horn a little bit here, and I'm gonna take this hat off now. I did say that this would be the most compelling case I've ever made, and that you, for once, may believe what I'm saying is true. Is that not correct? You did say that. <laughs> but you don't. It is the most compelling case you've ever made, but also you're at an advantage here because I already believe in extraterrestrials and would not rule out that they have been to Earth. If, if that's your total satisfaction, if that's what, then great. You've done it, Ryan. You've convinced me on a, on a case that I was already, you know, pretty, pretty lenient on. Yeah. Well, even though that's uh, dripping with sarcasm and is definitely not genuine, I'll take it. Score one for the Bugaras, case closed. Leave my house, town dunce. How dunce? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I now believe the things that you believe? Oh, shit! Is that where? <laughs> no, no. All right, you say so. In the end, no physical evidence of extraterrestrials or their tech has ever been found. In fact, two archeological digs took place on Foster Ranch in search of physical evidence and found nothing. Only proof that there was indeed a crash it's easy to see both sides. Skeptics wonder how it's possible that the military could have been so absolute in their cleanup and subsequent cover-up. Believers wonder how it's possible that there could be such consistent testimony among hundreds of witnesses down to small details of something that apparently never happened. One thing is for sure, what truly transpired near the sleepy town of Roswell, New Mexico will keep people debating, but for now, the answer will remain unsolved.